heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Hide at Bloomberg's world headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, the PC slump it continues. HP falls by the most, and at one point, three years. Cutting its profit outlook, we're going to bring you the state of consumer electronics. And as Apple sets a date for the launch of the iPhone 15, Huawei unveils a sophisticated but mysterious new smartphone that's captivated China's tech industry. Full coverage on both those stories ahead. And we're going to be hearing, of course, from the CEO, Grayscale, sitting down also with the leaders of Ford Pro and Bosch. We're going to be talking the state of EVs, of semiconductors, and so much more. But first, Bloomberg's Brody Ford, who, of course, has been all eyes on HP. And interesting, on the day that we also get HP that seemed a little bit more optimistic mm-hmm. about business spending. But is this all about more the corporate than the consumer when it comes to HP? So it's been this PC apocalypse for a year now. You know, it's been a long time of companies saying, it's bottoming out. People are going to start buying computers again, and it just keeps getting pushed back. And you have this question about, is it consumer, is it enterprise? For a while, I think people have assumed, OK, consumers aren't buying computers as much. That's OK, but businesses still will. But what was really concerning in last night's report was that enterprise was continuing to get a little weaker. Um, and the reasons for that is the kind of macro fears that every business feels, right? A, do we really want to spend some money right now? But also because of layoffs, right? You hire somebody new, you buy them a laptop pretty yeah. often. So you're less hiring people, you're less buying laptops. You know, I think, Brody, the, the thing about this story is that HP basically said, like, the PC demand picture is improving. It's just not improving as much or as quickly as we thought it was going to. Correct. Or that they said they was going to. Then there's the print business, which we never really talk about. That actually (laughs) was a big disappointment, right? That's correct. Yeah, the print business was hurt because uh, I think especially because of the weaker yen, some of the Japanese makers of printers were able to price better. And that's a big part of this story across computer and printer is that every single manufacturer is having this problem right now. Most of them are sitting on a bunch of inventory that it's, you know, getting older every single day. And so prices are really coming down. So, I mean, if you are looking to get a new laptop right now going into the holiday season, the general thought is they are going to be dumping a lot of material, a lot of inventory for lower prices. And good for a consumer, not so good for a corporate earnings report. Look at that printer pictures that we have. (laughs) Not using that nearly enough. Brody, I like that you mentioned the yen, and I like, therefore, that it sort of takes us global. Yeah. Because there is some weakness in China. How how global a picture is HP trying to paint us here? Because we get very focused Mm. on the US, particularly with the GDP data today. Yeah, they said that's a big part of it, is uh, weakness in China. It's economic weakness. But um, I didn't get the sense that that was a really major factor. I think that was part of the main constellation of factors. I think the piece that was most concerning is that businesses aren't buying new computers in the way that they expected. I think earlier in the year it was that, hey, as we get to the back half of the year, the economic picture will improve. We got back to school sales. We got Christmas. Life will be good. Um, and it just hasn't quite panned out that way. Um, and so, yeah, weakness in China is part of it. You know, cheaper printers in Japan because of the yen is part of it. But that U.S. consumer story, that U.S. business story is pretty close to the heart of what is driving down that stock. Bloomberg's Brody Ford on the PC apocalypse. Thank you for that apocalypse. one, Brody. Thank you. Bring it back. All right, uh, let's move from PCs and turn to a slowdown in the hedge fund industry, specifically funds run by Tiger Cubs, the name given to the protégés of Julian Robertson. Writing about this today, Bloomberg's Hema Palmer joins us from New York. You have the PC apocalypse, and then we go to <laughs> the cut of cash flow to a trickle, which I loved in your headline. But the numbers are quite dramatic. What's happening here? Yes, so these are some of the hedge fund industry's biggest names, uh, most influential stock pickers. For years, investors were clamoring to get into these hedge funds. Uh, We're talking about the Tiger Cubs. And um, what we're seeing now is after last year's very difficult year in terms of performance for so many of them, investors from the U.S. appear to be less likely um, and sort of souring on investing in these hedge funds. You're looking at a drop in the number of um, dollars that have 
come into these funds from U.S. investors, a drop of like 99 percent, 98 percent, 81 percent, pretty dramatic numbers. Dramatic. Just give us the context here. Any pushback that they might have is saying, look, they were closed funds. We were limiting the amount of cash that we're taking in. But is that a reality? So some of the funds were open. If we look at D1, Co2, Lone Pine, two of the funds were closed, Viking and uh, Tiger Global. The thing is, when it comes to a fund being closed, we have seen a number of funds take in as much as a billion dollars when they've been so-called closed. They could be uh, replacing redemptions. They could be making exceptions for influential investors or for big tickets. Uh, so a fund may be closed. And and even if they are and they do see a sharp reduction in inflows, um, as one of the people we quote in our story said, um, it may be a sign that the wait list of investors has dried up. That said, um, you know, Tiger Global did turn down a couple investors who wanted to invest in their fund. Uh, so we are, you know, it is a, a comprehensive sort of holistic look that we're taking here. But um, a fact that a fund is closed doesn't necessarily mean that money still doesn't come into that vehicle. Hema, you and the team have been uh, trawling through the Form D filings. You know, Cara and I went through all the 13 Fs. You're going through the Form D filings. What are they and, and what did they kind of tell you about the fund raising environment right now? Yes. So the Form Ds are the filings that these hedge funds have to have to do. And it shows um, how much these funds manage um, on an annual basis. And what we're seeing right now broader in the, the hedge fund fundraising environment is it's quite difficult. And it's been quite difficult for some time. So you're seeing, you know, $13 billion in redemptions from the hedge fund space in general. And so investors are pulling back from the universe. Um, you know, it's been tricky with performance. It's been tricky with rising interest rates. Um, for new funds that are launching, it can be also quite difficult to raise funds. So this is existing in an already difficult time to be uh, raising new capital, um, given that the steep de decline that we're seeing in inflows does seem to be even worse um, than just the environment itself. And the reason this is so important to our viewers, Hammer, is because we'll just look at Tiger Global's own website focused on public and private companies in the global internet, in the software, in the financial technology industries. This hits home particularly in this show. So we thank you so much for all of that when it comes to these Tiger Cubs. Hammer Palmer, brilliant reporting. Meanwhile, coming up. Look, we're going to get another sense check on this macro economy, on how much companies want to spend, particularly when it comes to the world of EVs. The CEO of Ford Pro is going to be joining us as they unveil new products to whoop, drive some strength, pun on the pun, in this commercial unit. Ted Cannon is going to be joining us, Ed. Yeah, I've got some breaking news actually in the last hour. This has moved very quickly. Bloomberg reported first that the cyber administration of China was going to pick Baidu as one of the first China tech companies authorized to issue a generative AI tool to the public. That happened. We reported that and the shares, the US ADRs really jumped. In the last few minutes, Baidu's posted a blog saying it's actually already going to start rolling out that, that generative AI tool to the public straight away. Um, you know, a a, a, a bit of a spike there, but interesting and fast-moving developments out of China. This is Bloomberg. Let's talk EVs. Let's talk Ford Pro, because it's the commercial division of Ford revealing new charging hardware for its array of end-to-end solutions to help make it basically easier for you, the commercial customer, to transition your fleet to electric. How is that going in this macro environment? I'm really pleased to welcome Ford Pro CEO Ted Canis. And Ted, wonderful to have you in the studio. And just answer that first. We've got to go micro into the detail of your business. But the macro pitch today, when GDP isn't as strong as expected, when jobs perhaps are not growing at quite the anticipated amount that we had seen, are people wanting to update, electrify, invest in their businesses? Absolutely. What we're seeing, Caroline, is what we said a second quarter is there is still three years of pent-up demand mm. for the vehicles, internal combustion and battery electric, doing all that supply chain problems that we had. And so we see customers for super duties and transits, both North America and Europe, looking for vehicles. My biggest challenge with most of my customers, hey customers, is mm. can I get more? Oh, interesting. Okay, so you're trying to marry up the supply-demand equation at the moment. I'm interested in, into ultimately, therefore, how you're setting yourself apart. What is it that makes them go, yes, for pro over anything else? Well, so we have this amazing backbone of the business that we have. All these commercial work trucks that we do for North America and Europe. We're number one in Europe for eight years in a row. We have 40% of the commercial and government share for full-size trucks and vans. We're the big guy. 
And what we're doing now is expanding in not just vehicles, in a connected world, it's vehicles, software, service, charging, financing, netting that all together so that we have this amazing business, a one-stop shop for our customers, just the easy button. Hey, Ted, it's good to catch up. You know, I, I actually find the commercial business fascinating because you're not just selling a, a vehicle that happens to be electric. You're kind of packaging it up. You mentioned your footprint in Europe. I just wondered if you had a better sense now of why that EV adoption is slower here in the US vis-a-vis -vis Europe and indeed China. Well, Ed, when you and I were first talking electric vehicles years ago and we we're getting ready to do the Lightning and other products that we weren't even had launched at the time, you know, America was a bit further behind. Cost of fuel in Europe was very high and there was already a lot of pressure to look for other solutions. And what we're seeing now, and actually in both regions, is it's just good business. Total cost of ownership, uptime, productivity solutions. They can save money on fuel, they can save money on repairs. It's a, it's a great solution for many customers in both regions, and that's what we're seeing. And that's why we upped a lot of our production demand for Lightning here in North America. And it's getting the right tool for the job, whether that's a van or a pickup truck to do the work. Jim Farley, the, the Ford CEO, has talked about the consumer, uh, you know, sort of rejecting higher prices for EVs. Do you see that from your commercial and fleet customers as well on the pricing issue? I'd say we're, we will carefully manage the pricing as we increase the uh, supply of vehicles now that we're going to the extra shifts that we put on in Lightning and have the battery capacity. So a lot of it is just education. I think in the commercial space, the decision process is longer in a company. This is a big investment, like in facilities or equipment. They're used to making investments, with making the equations, getting the Excel spreadsheet out. And that learning process is taking longer. And then you would stack on applying for incentives, utility infrastructure that's required. This turns into a longer process uh, that moves through the cycle. And that's where we're helping a lot of our customers and frankly our dealers as they work with so many new customers. You know, I've been out in some, uh, some vineyards and wineries very near to where I am now, Ted, and they demonstrated to me not just that they run the F-150 Lightning between point A and point B, but they're, they're using your data and software offering to kind of optimize that route, everything from like getting down to the most efficient mile they can drive. Peter Stearns just joined Ford, longtime Apple exec. I just wondered if you could tell us why that move came and, and what kind of impact he will have on improving that software offering. I think uh, the, the, this is core to the whole Ford Plus plan. I think we're all talking about electrification on, all the time, but the real secret is the software-defined vehicles and connected vehicles, digital and physical services. That is the big change. So when you have a vehicle that's signaling uh, a repair that needs to be made, you can pre-order the part, schedule at the dealership, link all that together like you're seeing so many cases where software can provide more convenient, more productive solutions for the customers. Peter is a specialist in that space. He's been doing subscription services at large volume at Apple with that kind of science that he seen of where and how to change the experience for the customers in a very positive way. And he's going to come lend us that experience both on the pro side, but in our other software-defined businesses, for example, Blue Cruise, where you can have hands-free driving on the highways in the Blue Cruise zones, which also in the future will be appealing to commercial customers. Imagine a customer who is, can get his time back on the highway. Time is just a huge value. Or you're in traffic coming on in the London on N25 and you're stuck in those miles and miles of queues. It's a great thing to not have to be hand the hands on the wheel. You could do something else. You know a couple of people you're talking to who understand the M25 trials and tribulations. I'm interested in, <laughs> though, you talked about the supply-demand dynamic, the fact that sort of your headache is getting enough vehicles into your clients' hands. How much more of a headache is that when you're still trying to negotiate with workers, particularly with the United Auto Workers? I mean, how is that going to your bit of the business? Well, I think the main thing for us is, you know, the workers are our team. We're all one team. And, uh, you know, one of the things we're proud of is we build more vehicles in America than anybody else. We employ more hourly guys in than anybody else. We export more than anybody else. So it's a team that's doing these. And we're happy to produce all these F-Series vans and pickups in the U.S. So when we look at that, when it's, it's going to go through that process now. It, this is a normal negotiation. I'm not in the heads and throws. But I can say I was in Kansas City this week uh, visiting our team there because we'd just gone to three shifts on transit earlier this year because the demand is so strong. 
for Pro CEO Ted Canis. We always talk about EVs in the context of the consumer, and we, we don't talk as much about these small and large businesses buying up fleets. Thank you so much for your time. Time now for work shifting. Look, it's where we're going to have a look at the changing landscape of the labor market amid all of these advances in technology. And first up, after many layoffs, tech employers, they're now beefing up staff with specialities in AI, of course. The Bay Area is now quickly becoming the epicenter, one for you, Ed. Meanwhile, OpenAI is on track for $1 billion of annual revenue with businesses adopting the technology behind ChatGPT. And turning back to that court ruling, cancelling the SEC's order to reject Grace Scale's spot Bitcoin ETF application, Grayscale CEO Michael Sunshine joined Bloomberg TV earlier. Let's take a listen. We will have to see upon the final operational procedures that come through that final mandate that the court will issue. So you don't know, but you may. We don't know what the final opinion will say until we reach the end of that period, correct? Um, is there, I've been reading uh, stuff from yesterday too, that you, know, you may have won this battle, but then lose the war and that there's a bunch of other competitors now. So now yes. you're not gonna be the only horse in town. Yes, so this is a topic we've talked about before, ladies. It's really a, a world in which there are multiple spot products is a world that Grayscale has long been ready for. There are multiple Bitcoin futures products. We believe that there will be a world in which there are multiple spot Bitcoin products. That being said, we want investors to have choice. And some of the things that we do think investors will look to when they are making those allocation decisions are the size of the fund, the liquidity of the fund, the track record of the fund, right? Let's not forget that GBTC is the largest Bitcoin fund in the world. It's owned by millions and millions of investors. It has three plus percent of the outstanding Bitcoin supply and really now has almost a 10 year track record of operational success, right? Whereas a lot of the other products coming to market are really making use of GBTC's operations, disclosures, reporting, and GBTC is really paving the way to broaden out that market. There's another massive market question here, and it's not just about the pace and time, it's about the structure and the fees. Because if you look at BlackRock, Invesco, Fidelity, these are asset managers with a history of coming in low. And if you look at the fees that you have offered and really has made a very profitable entity for Digital Currency Group and Grayscale, how much lower exactly can fees get for the Grayscale product in the form of an ETF? Well, what I've committed to historically and we'll say again to you today is we are committed to lowering fees when GBTC converts to an ETF. We'll obviously have to come back on and talk to you about what the fees are when that conversion actually happens. So the other My strangeness here is the discount that uh, the GBTC is currently trading at. You had gone from 24 yesterday to 15 below net asset value back to 20. Can you answer to this market volatility here and the uncertainty that investors are grappling with as you head towards this process? Well, there's a couple of things in that dynamic. So number one, there certainly was increased trading volume yesterday in GBTC. A lot of excitement and enthusiasm based on the victory that GBTC shareholders had in the court yesterday. Now, as we eventually approach an ETF, you'd expect that eventually there will be an arbitrage mechanism through the ETF that will allow for any premiums or discounts to be eliminated. Um, that's a really, really important function of why ETFs serve in the capacity that they do. And it's really the core of what we've been fighting for throughout this entire lawsuit. Let's go some more. Bloomberg Shanali Bassett here. That was the interview that we wanted to get. You got it. What else did you learn from it? Some things are really important here. If you look at the way GBTC, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, is trading. When I sat here with you yesterday, Ed, it was at a 15% discount to net asset value. That has gotten a little wider today to 21% as I sit here with you today. Why? Because there's still uncertainty around the path forward to an ETF for GBTC, more around that timeline especially. One of those key concerns here, and you heard it from Michael Sonnenschein himself, they don't know yet whether they have to refile to convert to an ETF in the wake of this process. And remember, there is a timeline here. We don't know whether the SEC will fight the decision. And Michael Sonnenschein himself said that this is day one of a 45-day process in which the SEC can request potentially an unbanked hearing. Now, the ruling yesterday was three to zero. So this is not quite likely, per se. It would definitely be going against what the court had said unanimously yesterday. However, it could certainly happen, and it would hold things up even further. These things are never quick, but Shanali Vasek is always quick with the information. We thank her so much.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. One name that's outperforming on the mega cap side, Apple, up 1.8%. We know the story, Caro. I know what I'm doing in a couple of weeks' time. This one's exciting. Yeah, it's 24 hours ago that you got that invite for Wanderlust. Hmm, does that mean travel? I wonder what it means. That's what Apple is calling its next event anyway, set for September the 12th, where the company will unveil the iPhone 15 line, we understand. It's next generation smartwatches, of course. All of that is according to our chief correspondent, Mark Gurman, who always knows the news ahead of time. Mark, Wanderlust, just what exactly do you think they're hinting at there if it's not the iPhone 15s and, and the yes. smartwatches? Yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily think the the name of the event Wanderlust is hinting at much, uh, but if you look at the Apple logo uh, in the invitation, the colors in there uh, will be the colors of the next generation Pro phones. There's going to be a navy blue. Uh, there will be a new version of the space black. Uh, there's going to be a new gray, which is closer to the look of natural titanium. The material they're switching to for the iPhone 15 Pro uh, and Pro Max. And then there's also going to be uh, another new color uh, silver, a new version of silver and white. Uh, so those colors are hinted at in the logo. Uh, and then you see sort of a powdery substance, a powdered metal substance, and uh, I'll have more on that soon. Uh, but definitely this is going to be around three products, the iPhone, the Apple Watch, uh, and the AirPods. So the high-end and low-end iPhones, the Apple Watch Series 9, and second-generation Apple Watch Ultra, and updated AirPods Pro with a new charging port, USB-C. You know, Mark, the colour's important. My smartphone of choice is blue for Chelsea Football Club. <laughs> but are we actually going to get any hardware updates in the 15 relative to the 14? You know, you talk about this a lot in your reporting that generation to generation, sometimes they're, they're just very slight changes. There's going to be major changes across all four models uh, this year. So the 14 was a pretty small update on the non-pro side. The, the 15, the regular 15, the regular 15 plus, those are going to get a 48 megapixel back camera, the A16 chip, and the dynamic island. So essentially the hardware upgrades in last year's 14 Pro. Uh, the 15 Pro and Pro Max will get that new titanium frame I mentioned. Uh, the first three nanometer Apple processor, the A17 chip much thinner bezels, borders around the display, coming close to 1.5 millimeters, thinnest borders around the display in any mass-produced smartphone. You're also, on the biggest phone, going to get a new camera. It's called a periscope camera. That's the technical term. It allows you to do much deeper optical zoom. So right now, you can zoom in at a rate of 3x. This will now double to 6x uh, without needing to use digital zoom, so you'll retain that clarity because it uses the actual hardware lens for the zoom rather than software. And the EU but the big change having will, its way, thing, Mark, with the charging? Yes, that's exactly what I was going to say. The, the, the big fuss, I think, is going to be this USB-C port. This is going to be the second time in the history of the iPhone that they've changed the charging port. In 2012, they moved from the iPod connector to the Lightning connector. This time, they're moving to USB-C. Slightly larger than the connector they use today, still reversible. But on the Pro phones, it'll allow you to do very fast data transfers over the cable. So if you're taking high-resolution video, you'll get those big transfer speeds there. Uh, the downside is, if you've been using using lightning connectors to charge your iPhone over the last mm -hmm. decade, you're going to need a new cable. The good news is the new cable will come in the box. The bad news is, is that you may need to buy a new charging adapter, the brick that goes into the wall, because you're moving from USB-A, right, or USB-2, uh, as others call it, to USB-C. It's a different size connector, and so some people may need to make that change. All right, Apple up 1.9% September 12th. The date to watch our thanks to Bloomberg's Mark Gurman. Okay, Apple isn't the only company breathing new life into the smartphone market. Huawei has unveiled a slim bezeled Mate 60 Pro, sparking hopes that China tech firms are able to overcome US sanctions and curbs, giving life to that domestic smartphone market. Bloomberg's Ian King is with me on set about what was a strange surprise overnight. I'm going to say two things before I hand it over to you. The details of this phone were not registered with the Chinese regulator, which is unusual. But what happened was loads of local media outlets and fans in China did teardowns. They tore the thing apart. And that takes us to the processor, which they say was etched with five nanometer nodes. Over to you. Why is that it's surprising. Yeah, I mean, you, we need to understand, and I think you emphasize it correctly, this is speculation at this point. Yes. 
Well, the bottom line is, if they have that kind of technology in their semiconductors, then it's, it's almost impossible to have done that without circumventing direct U.S. trade restrictions mm -hmm. on supplying that company with technology. Something is going on here if all of this speculation is correct. And, you know, I'm sure the U.S. government is taking a long look at that. Yeah. Coincidence I mean, that they announced this when Gina Raimondo, the Secretary of Commerce, was right. visiting China? You be the judge. I mean, it's interesting because they almost... Well, it was a very subtle announcement, and it's mainly taken off on Weibo and people trying to piece together the pieces here. And really, we understood and potentially thought that some stockpiling could have gone on pre prior to this, right, with TSMC chips. Could it be that? Or is it more in line with the story that you brought us last week, that there are these sort of shadow supply chains, shadow chip manufacturing going on across China at the moment by Huawei? Yeah, I mean, again, there's a lot of speculation. There are a lot of moving parts going on, and, and you know, a lot of that was based upon our reporting and our understanding of, of what is going on. And the, the bottom line is Huawei is not a major smartphone maker anymore, not even close. Remember, they got rid of their smartphone division because of the weight of sanctions. So really what's going on here is kind of a, a symbolic or a concentrated effort to get technology to show that China, hey, we're not out of this yet. You're not hurting us as much as you think. Maybe we've got a future down our own path. That's how it's being interpreted. Um, who's doing it? how they're doing it. That's something that everybody is chasing, including us right now, and uh, that could have major implications for the relationship between the two countries. So the basics of it are that Huawei has been on the entities list since 2019, Trump era. Yeah. And the reason the US government did that was accusations that Huawei was helping the Chinese military with technology. Mm. Um, but what was notable overnight is lots of Chinese suppliers saw their stocks jump. Um, what did you make of that? Is the, is the inference we're drawing, and again, Bloomberg's not been able to verify many of these local media reports, but is it that actually China could stand on its own two feet in 5G, for example, which is not yet done? Yeah, I mean, that's been the concern all along, that by basically pushing them into a corner, they would go in their own direction, develop their own native technologies, and be no longer dependent upon the West and no longer need to really interact with the West because they have such a huge of their own market. And, you know, this development, even though it's relatively small and even though it's probably only a relatively small number of devices, you've got to remember as well from a technology perspective, anybody, well not anybody, but you can make a few chips, right? Very high quality, very low you know, nodes in terms of manufacturing. M mass producing them is an entirely different thing. But the military doesn't need hundreds of millions of these things. So all kinds of alarm bells ringing around this. Ian King, just such in-depth reporting. Thank you so much as we peel back the onion of really what's happening over there with Huawei. Meanwhile, look, we're just going to go outside the world of tech for a moment. We want to quickly check in on some stocks that are really moving. Marijuana stocks, they're surging after the US Department of Health and Human Services has actually sent a letter to the Drug Informants Agency urging them to loosen rules when it comes to cannabis. A lot of these stocks are actually getting stopped on volatility. We're up 18%, let's call it, on Tilray. We're seeing some of the ETFs that are in lockstep really powering on higher. So this is a focus, of course, last October. Biden rolled out some initiatives, Ed, focused on marijuana, including pardoning all prior federal offences for simple possession. So this looks like we could be taking another step in that direction. Meanwhile, coming up, look, Bosch is in the process of acquiring TSI semiconductors. Very pleased to say we're going to be joined by Bosch's CEO, Stefan Harton, to discuss the company's plans right there in California, Ed. Yeah, and speaking of chips, I'm also taking a quick look at shares of NVIDIA. The market slowdown just has not stopped analysts from ratcheting up their share price targets. Rosenblatt Securities has a target of $1,100 a share, which if NVIDIA hit that, would give the company a market value of more than $2.7 trillion. By the way, Apple's $2.9 trillion valuation, they would become trillion-ish rivals. <laughs> Talk about more chip stuff next. This is Bloomberg Technology. All right, global giant Bosch will close the acquisition of U.S. chipmaker TSI Semiconductors in the next week. The world's biggest auto parts supplier plans to invest more than $1.5 billion in its California foundry, expanding the German company's global bet on chips 
Delighted to say that the chairman of uh, Bosch's board, CEO, Stefan Hartong, joins me here on set in San Francisco. So the deal will close. This is something you and I have discussed in the past. The big question is how quickly you operationalize it and get that silicon carbide into your supply chain. Yeah, that's obviously a story of a bit more work because we have got a great asset here with a great base and also about 250 specialists. This is the most important thing to it. But there's a lot of construction to happen. We have to upgrade the site. We have to bring new machines. We have to bring equipment. And then the process chain, which we have developed, has to be in place here. So it will take some years, but we will get it speeded up as much as we can. So I would say in two, three years, we will see results. We learned from the pandemic era, it's very tricky to plan capacity on the foundry side. And lots of people got it wrong. Yes. You already have two fabs in, in Europe. You add this third in California. Will you continue buying up these smaller fab operations based on your capacity forecast? Well, right now with this set we are working on, so extending our fab in, in Dresden and also extending our fab in Reutlingen, plus the partnership we have just joined with TSMC on the fab in Germany they built, plus the fab we have now here with TSI in the States, which is great. That's a good portfolio. And that's, let's say, a whole bunch of workload for us, which I think we first have to pull through. So don't expect too many further steps when we go ahead. But this work will be, uh, be very busy for us in the next years. Silicon carbide, Stefan. Now, what is the ultimate end total addressable market as you see it right now? Because there were some reports that maybe Tesla's trying to well, downshift the amount that it uses within its more lower price vehicles. Is that a concern in any way or do you think just the ultimate market is still there and huge? No, silicon carbide has great benefits for the vehicles, right? You can better charge the vehicle, reduce the losses in charging by 50%. You can uh, extend the, the length of run of the vehicle by 6%, so, so you can run the vehicle longer, reduce the battery size. So especially also for, for let's say, more price-sensitive vehicles, this is also a great technology. The question right now, obviously, is it's not deployed massively in all vehicles because just the capacity on the world is not there. And it's ramped up a massive speed by multiple players. So I think it will have a, a massive impact on the electrification, but the electrification itself also is ramping up. So I would still see it as a, as a great ingredient for all electrified applications, not only cars, by the way. And interestingly, of course, not just cars, but all the other products in which this is going to be useful. What about the ultimate consumer demand as you see it? We just had, of course, Ford Pro on and Ted really talking us through how he still sees really demand not being the problem. It's more supply side at the moment. Do you feel even with the US GDP data that we get today, are you still confident in end demand for these sorts of products right now? Now, for a product like Secret and Carbide, and also for electrification of vehicles in total, we have to get a bit longer view. The current situation where we have also risk in the demand side are absolutely clear. That is globally, and we still see inflation, which is uh, it has been reported in Germany at 6.1%, for example, as a contrast to also the U.S. So the fight against inflation will go on, and that will also soften demand in many products. But for the long run, and we talk here three to five years, demand, especially for electrified vehicles, will grow massively, and that is more a problem to have the supply ready for that demand in the future. You know, Dr. Harton, Bosch is a truly global company. Thank you for, for mentioning the, the European economic data as well as the US. But China really interests both Caroline and I. It's a daily discussion. You grew revenues there 3% in 2022. What does 2023 look like based on your experience of doing business in the Chinese economy? Well, the Chinese economy is much softer in the recovery as we expected it. We all see that. Plus, we also see that the Chinese currency is much softer than we all anticipated it. That's a fact that's obviously against the global growth. And that's obviously also things that even if China will report something like the GDP growth of about 5%, that's still a risk for the global economy growth. And China contributing a third of the growth, that was kind of the story on the beginning of the year, that may not be happening this year. But still... Bosch sticks to its targets. We want to grow at 6 to 9% this year, and we go for it on the global platforms, obviously before currency effects, because we don't know yet what the currency effects will play out and whether it's soft Chinese one. There's obviously risk on the currency side. Can you just go into the geopolitical side as well, Stefan? Because that must be a fascinating thing for you to have to navigate, not just FX risk, but ultimately supply chain risk. How are you navigating the headwinds when we see Gina Raimondo over in China at the moment, but still the Huawei issue that we just reported on? Well, the supply chain risk we had, especially on semiconductor, obviously much less. 
And also some other supply chain risks are much fewer of those currently because of the soft demand in China and the fewer export we have in China. That means a lot of materials are much easier available for the global supply, which is led, leading to the better fulfillment of current demand. But still, we shouldn't feel too safe about all of this, right? Because if demand picks up, if China comes back with a, a bit uh, speedier pace, right, and also the demand in the U.S. goes back up in a higher pace, plus the European demand, which is very low at the current uh, size, then we could also see, again, supply chain issues. So we are always on the watch, and we are working with our factories and our sourcings and our partner heavily on getting these supply questions into shape for the next wave of demand. Absolutely fascinating bird's eye perspective, not only in the consumer, but of course more broadly on geopolitics and global economies. Bosch CEO Stefan Hartung. Music event? Guess again. Investment event. Welcome to InvestFest, where 20,000 people gathered in Atlanta, Georgia to boost their financial literacy and have a good time. All thanks to the platform Earn Your Leisure. People are here to learn about entrepreneurship, about investing, how to build wealth, how to build a network. They came to hear from the wealthiest black Americans, from cultural icons like Diddy, and from money managers like Mike Novogratz and Kathy Wood. So what are some of the biggest money mistakes that a lot of these millionaires and billionaires, well, they've been making? My biggest money mistake was waiting until I was 57 years old to start my business. I was a seed investor in Peloton. And I put $300,000 in, and at one point, it was worth $7 million at a billion-dollar valuation. And two of my friends were on the board, and they're like, dude, it's now scaling. Don't sell. But I had never had a venture win, and so I was just so ready to ring the bell, and I took profits. Still a great investment. And that $7 million would have been worth $200 million at the high. Hmm. Locked them all out. <laughs> I've just erased them from my head. It never happened. It never happened. Eddie might be blocking out some of his mistakes, but where he puts his money now, real estate. He likes his land. But also, remember, he's got an e commerce platform particularly focused right. on black creators, on black companies. So he's focusing on the tech angle there of, of really his future and wealth. But also, uh, speaking about some of the best advice that they're giving at the moment, Mike Novogratz is saying, have a stop loss. Like basically, no matter how yeah. convinced you are of particular technology, dare I say crypto, make sure that you have some sort of way of ensuring you don't, well, lose too much money in that. You know, it was it's so interesting to hear that that Peloton story from Novogratz. Yeah. That you should, we should get that out there more. But what was interesting, me, Carrie, a new city for you. Mm. What was it like being there in that particular city? One we don't talk about as much. And actually, we should talk about it more. The amount of content creation, because remember, Amazon Studios are over in Atlanta. There are some enormous companies that are investing in technology. You think Delta is based there? Coca Cola is over there. But really, this is a Atlanta. I have to say, everyone was so well dressed. Like it was the funnest conference I've ever been to. But as a city, beautiful, hot, but everyone is so on point when it comes to how they're like, approaching life and delivering themselves. Yes. All right, check Carrie's piece out on Reels, on TikTok, and of course, on X as well. Okay, rethinking things in what venture capitalists do, but it's not always easy to do that within existing cities. So today, we take a look at the trend of VCs wanting to build the ultimate tech dream, better cities. Bloomberg Sarah McBride here with the Tech Daily newsletter. This was a really interesting one because San Francisco often thinks of itself in that way. Right. You know, we are tech. We have built this city in the way and we have a load of problems. Just give us the overview of your so Tech Daily. Every couple of years, somebody in tech decides they can build a better city. They give it a go and then it just kind of fizzles out. And then somebody else comes along seemingly unaware of all the previous efforts and tries it again. And this seems to be what's happening right now with these efforts in Solano County, just uh, northeast of San Francisco, yes. to build a better city. Sarah, so, who are the names um, that we know that are so behind this? So big, big VC names, like uh, Mike Moritz, who uh, is one of the VCs from Sequoia Capital, Mark Andreessen, Lorraine Powell Jobs, who has Emerson Collective, so smart people who've accomplished a lot and have a ton of money. So if anybody can do it, they can. 
but many, many people just like them have thought the same thing previously and unfortunately failed. Hmm. Milton Keynes even gets a shout out in your story. I absolutely love that bit. Sarah yeah, McBride, okay. we thank you. Meanwhile, that is it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology, Ed. Yeah, please recap on the podcast. We're on iHeart, we're on Spotify, and we're on our Bloomberg platforms. From over here in San Francisco and out on the East Coast, New York, this is Bloomberg Technology. Bloomberg Technology.